Today we're going to be starting a new series called 30 Second Theology. I know what many of you are thinking, this is going to be awesome, a 30 second message every single Sunday. This is the type of sermon that I like to listen to. Well, we're actually going to be looking at commercials and what commercials try to sell us. You see, every single day, all during the day, commercials are bombarding us, giving us different messages, telling us that, uh, you know, we need to look out for number one, that beauty is the most important thing, that youth is victorious all of the time, that we all want to be younger, that, you know, a pain-free life is only a pill away. And we're going to be comparing some of those type of messages with the messages that we find from God. So we're looking at those 30-second theologies and kind of seeing what God's perspective is on it. And my hope is that as we, uh, as we kind of look at these different, um, these different commercials and as we look at these different things that are, are coming our way, what the world is trying to tell us, what the culture is trying to tell us that's important, and we contrast that with God, that we will be set free from this, these lies that we are being told by our culture. So let's get right into it. Here's week one of 30 Second Theology. Well, I'm Francis Harris, worked for the San Jose Police Department from 1995 to 25. I showed up to a place I'd never been, and there was a guy with a drafting board. We couldn't see them, they couldn't see us. Tell me about your hair. I didn't know what he was doing. But then I could tell after several questions that he was stopping me. Tell me about your chin. It kind of protrudes a little bit. Hmm. Especially when I smile. Your jaw? My mom told me I had a big jaw. What would be your most prominent feature? Kind of a fat, rounder face. The older I've gotten, the more freckled I've gotten. I'd say I have a pretty big forehead. Once I get a sketch, I say thank you very much, and then they leave. I don't see it. All I had been told before the sketch was to have get friendly with this other woman, Chloe. Today I'm going to ask you some questions about a uh, person you met earlier, and I'm going to ask you some general questions about their face. She was thin, so you could see her cheekbones. And her chin? It was a nice, thin chin. She had nice eyes. They were out when she spoke. She had blue eyes, very nice blue eyes. So here, this is a sketch that you helped me create. And that's a sketch that somebody described of you. Yes. That's a pretty cool commercial, isn't it? That is a great one. A little longer than 30 seconds, but a good one. I tried to draw uh, my kids at home, and neither of the pictures looked like them at all. They were just stick figures. But that guy has some amazing ability. We are a culture obsessed with beauty, aren't we? We are obsessed. We have placed beauty above almost every other attribute that a human could possibly have. We are totally enamored with beauty. Uh, getting plastic surgery is commonplace. 
going on crazy diets all of the time to try to lose just a couple more pounds is a billion dollar business. We have makeup to cover things up, highlights to highlight certain features, clothes that fit us in a certain way, and we are paying top dollar to make it happen. Now let me just state from the very beginning, I am not opposed to beauty. I married the most beautiful woman on the face of the planet. I'm a theologian, not an idiot, folks. <laughs> and even though, uh, even though there's nothing wrong with beauty, I think we could all agree that when we are obsessed with beauty, things can go awry pretty quickly. When we are focused or obsessed with how we look, our attitudes and actions can become shallow and superficial. Not only for a culture, but also for us personally. And if we are focused on what we look like all of the time and what other people look like all the time, and if we place that beauty value above everything else, then we will indeed be shallow and superficial at best. Now my hope today and throughout this whole series is not to try to convince you to get up on a soapbox and to yell at our culture and tell our culture all that it's doing wrong. I don't think, I don't, I don't think that's going to accomplish very much at all. Uh, but my hope is a little bit more personal. Uh, my hope today and throughout this series is to inspire you to consider how these different lies that are being told us in our culture are affecting you personally, are affecting the ways that you look at your friends and your family, and, are, and that you would kind of see in a, in a clearer way how God really views you, how God really views the world, and that would then inspire you to live differently and to actually think differently and feel differently about yourself. And that you would be set free. That you would be able to walk in freedom. And today in particular, my hope is that you would have a God-honoring view of beauty. That you would have a God-honoring view of beauty as you move forward from here. So I'm going to pray for us. Can, can you join with me? God, I know that our culture every single day is screaming at us to be beautiful, to be pretty on the outside, to be thin, to be something that maybe we could never obtain. And God, this is weighing us down. It's holding us in bondage. And I pray, God, that you would help shed some clarity on that for us, that you would help shed some light into our hearts expose these lies that we are believing and set us free today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I would like you to maybe grab something to write with and jot a few things down because I'm going to give you a few different ways uh, to help you really define and help you cultivate a God-honoring view of beauty inside of your life, inside of your heart, inside of your brain, and hopefully inside of your families and friendships as well. Three things you need to know about obtaining a God-honoring view of beauty. Number one, God's perspective on a beautiful person. You have to grasp today what God's perspective is on a beautiful person. Have you ever wondered what God thinks about beautiful people? Does God use beautiful people? Does he choose to elevate beautiful people above everybody else? Has he kissed certain physical attributes of individuals and said, now you are special and I can use you to a great degree? Well, certainly in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, we find beautiful people being used by God. I was thinking about some of them, and I jotted a few of them down. Of course, Eve was beautiful. She was the first woman who was naked and felt no shame. She must have been something special. She must have been. As a matter of fact, here recently, they were doing some archaeological digging up in the uh, Middle East, and as they were digging up, they found some old ancient writings that uh, actually had been written by Adam. Pretty amazing little discovery. I don't know if you saw that in the news or not. And they actually unearthed some of this ancient kind of Hebrew text that told us a little bit more about Adam's perspective of Eve and her beauty. You know, very early on, uh, Adam said to Eve, Eve, you are the most beautiful woman on the face of the planet. Wait for it. 
She was the only girl on the face of the planet. She was really smoking hot. All right, number two, there was Saul, King Saul, the first king of Israel. He was handsome, and he was actually a tall, dark, and handsome kind of guy. The scripture tells us he was head and shoulders above the rest. David was a good-looking guy. He was so good-looking, we made a statue of him naked. you got to be a good-looking guy to get a statue of you naked. That's for sure. There's Esther. She was a beautiful gal that God used to set his people free. And the way that he used her is that she became the most attractive person in the kingdom. Uh, this king took her in as his wife, and then she was able to have influence in his life because of that. Samson, of course, was a good-looking guy. He had long hair, wore spandex, looked like an 80s rocker. Joseph was a good-looking guy. He, took, uh, he caught the eye of Potiphar's, for Potiphar's wife. Matter of fact, some say that uh, people named Joseph are some of the most beautiful people ever to walk on the face of the planet. And while there were attractive people in the Bible, there were also some very ordinary people who had some ordinary features. Did you know that um, Elisha, the great prophet, was bald? How do we know this? Well, because he got really upset. Write down this verse, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 and following. In this passage, Elisha is walking up to a certain city called Bethel, and as he's walking on his way, some kids come running out, and they start taunting him. Hey, Baldy! Hey, Baldy! And they start making fun of him. Well, this doesn't please Elisha, so he calls down a curse upon these little children. And as he calls upon the curse upon these kids, two bears come out of the woods and maul like 40 of the children. He was a little sensitive about his baldness, but he was bald nonetheless and used greatly by God. There was a guy named Eli. He was a prophet. God used him to raise up uh, Samuel the prophet. And he was a rather large individual. He was so large that when he fell down one time, he snapped his neck uh, because he was heavy. And then probably one uh, person that you've maybe overlooked that's kind of an ordinary dude that God uses in the scripture uh, over and over again is a guy by the name of Jesus. Did you know that Jesus was an ordinary looking fellow? There were actually times in his ministry where he would show up in the public eye and people would overlook him because he was nothing special physically. Isaiah chapter 53 told us that he would be nothing special physically. And it tells us here in Isaiah 53 verse 2 that there was nothing physically attractive about Jesus that we should be attracted to him. It wasn't like he was this gorgeous, knockout, calendar-worthy type of an individual. Now, while we don't know for sure because we have not asked God, I think we can conclude that God must not have thought the physical thing that important if he didn't make his one and only son a standout in the crowd. Here, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel in the Old Testament, chapter 16. God is about getting ready to, uh, to bring up David, and he's having all of his brothers run before Samuel the prophet. And in chapter 16, verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Do you want to know what God thinks is beautiful? God thinks people are beautiful when they are beautiful on the inside. You might be good looking. You might get your way at a job. You might get yourself an extra interview. You might get yourself a raise. You might get yourself somebody special. You might get pictures taken about you. You might get a lot of likes on Instagram because of your external appearance. But when it comes to God, your external appearance means nothing. Nothing at all. God could care less what you look like. And aren't you glad? God does not judge by external appearances at all. What God thinks is beautiful are things on our inside. How we love Him. How we love others what we do to impact the world, what we do to invest in our children. God cares about matters of the heart, matters of the soul, not external matters. Men and women, what God thinks is beautiful 
has nothing to do with your skin. It has nothing to do with your height, with how far apart your eyes are, how close they are, what color they are, how far your nose sticks out of your face, how far it spreads, whether you have an innie or an outie. God doesn't care. He's not in to the external appearance at all. What God thinks is beautiful is all on the inside. If we're going to have a God-honoring view of beauty, we have to make sure that we understand what God thinks is beautiful. Second, if we're going to have a God-honoring view of beauty, we have to have a different perspective about others. We need to pay attention to our perspective of other people. I think we bought into the lie that if you are pretty, you are worth listening to. This is a lie that our culture puts out there. If you are good looking, then you are worth my time, you are worth my effort, you are worth my money, you are worth me emulating. You must be an expert if you are good looking, regardless of how dumb that person might be, regardless of how uneducated that person might be, regardless of how, how unholy that individual might be, we in our culture have said, you know what, if you are pretty, we are going to look up to you. That's why when people go look for spokespeople for their uh, different products, they go and try to find models, they try to find star athletes, they try to find actresses and actors, they try to look for the beautiful people in our society because we have all bought into the lie that in order for me to value another individual, they have to be good looking. Men and women, a godly perspective about such things uh, means that we do not consider the external appearance of somebody at all when we consider their value. Here are a couple verses to jot down. Romans chapter 2, verse 11. In Romans 2, verse 11, the Apostle Paul tells us that God does not show favoritism. Here, speaking about race not considering the Jew more special than the Gentile. So in our case, we're talking here about skin. And you know what? We need to not show favoritism. That is a God-honoring view. To look at another individual and, and treat them with value regardless of how they look is what God desires us to do. And I bet in your life, because I know this is true in mine, there have been times where you've looked at an individual, they have not been that attractive, and you have not been attracted to them just naturally, and maybe, just maybe, you have treated them poorly because of such of an appearance. We need to pray that God will neutralize that perspective in our hearts, that bent that we have, that we've been told by our culture, and that we would see others the way that God sees them. In 2 Corinthians 5.16, the apostle tells us this. We no longer consider anybody according to the world standards or according to external appearances, but we consider everybody now in regards to what Christ has done for us. We view everybody through the eyes of Jesus. Everyone. As God often does, he brought a very tangible example of this to our team this week. Uh, we got a call. Joy took it. Um, Joy, our administrator, took it and answered the phone. And there was a gal calling from upstate Washington. And she would like to know if our church would be able to minister to her son who was on across the country bike ride. She was really concerned about him. It seemed like he had somehow gotten some poisoning into his blood system and was becoming um, a, a little bit delirious. And just from the description of him, she said, you know what? He looks homeless. People don't want to help him. He, I really just feel for my son. Could somebody please go and help him? He was up in Anthem. We gave her the names of some churches that are right around the corner from where he is, said, hey, could you give these guys a call? They're right there. They could help him instantly. Um, and then we followed up with her and just said, hey, how'd it go? She goes, I can't reach anybody. And so Jared, Joy, and I were sitting around talking about it. And Jared's like, hey, man, let's just go. I got a truck. I can pick up his bike. We can take him to whatever he needs to do and get him whatever he needs. I said, okay, man, I got a lot going on, but yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So we hopped in the truck and we went up there. And uh, I just want to tell you five good things that happened 
out of this scenario. First of all, on the way up there, I began to think to myself, yes, of course we should go. Of course we should go. If my son Caleb was halfway around the country and in need, I would hope that another Christ follower would jump up to the cause and help my son out. So I felt this is a good thing that we are doing right here. Then as we got out of the truck, I saw him, and indeed he did look homeless and disheveled and looked like he hadn't showered in a couple weeks. And I thought to myself, hmm, this is going to be a little bit interesting. If you know me, I'm a little bit of a germaphobe. I thought, oh, Lord, you got to help me here. And I thought, how am I supposed to treat this guy? And I heard the Spirit say, you treat him like if it were Jesus. So I walked over to him, gave him a big handshake, looked him square in the eye, greeted him friendly. Jared did the same thing. We lifted his stuff, put it in the back of the truck. I went over, and the third thing I did is I opened the door for him. I said, here you go, sir. Come on in. Now, I must admit, I still took the front seat. I don't like riding in the back. Nobody's perfect, after all. <laughs> then the fourth thing that we did is we went down to the hospital. We dropped him off so he could get some care. And as he got out, I thought, now, what would I want to happen? I said, you know what I would want to happen? I'd want somebody to pray for me. So I prayed for him right there in the parking lot, to which he seemed to really appreciate it. And the fifth thing was, after he got out of the hospital, uh, Jared and I were trying to figure out who best could minister to him overnight. Um, and we called a, a guy here at Journey. We called him up. He jumped right in on the opportunity, brought him into his home, fed him some meals, got him a shower, cleaned up his little cart, cleaned up his uh, clothes, and got him set on his way the next day. Five good things that happened well. As I was putting the sermon together, I had some time to reflect on that experience. And I just want to tell you that while those five things were good, there were two things that were not good at all and that I'm actually a little embarrassed to tell you about. Number one, I didn't want to go. I didn't. I didn't want to go because it was inconvenient, because I knew how this whole thing was going to play out, because I'd been down this road before. I grew weary in doing good, and I didn't want to go. I didn't want to help. And upon further reflection, I realized why, you know what? I'm pretty sure I would have jumped at the opportunity if that guy would have been beautiful in the world's standards. I pretty, I'm pretty confident if I got a call and somebody said there is a famous person in Anthem that's very attractive, that I need you to go and help pick up, I would have been out the door before I said, before they said goodbye. And I found inside of me what maybe you can find inside of you. That is that I have bought into the lie to one degree or another that people are valuable because of how they look in the world standards. Men and women, this can't be us. We can't have this perspective inside of our hearts. And if we're going to have a godly view of beauty, we have to be men and women that can look past the external and see the, the God-given value inside of every individual. We can't fall prey to the world's definition of beauty. We can't do it. A God-honoring view of beauty is a godly perspective about others, God's perspective about Beautiful people. And then finally, and this one's probably the most difficult to understand, you have to have a beautiful perspective about yourself. <laughs> yes, you need to know what God thinks about people. That might be easiest for us to understand. Yes, we can all recognize we need to have a, a, a non-external view about others. But when it comes to ourselves, it is very difficult to have a healthy, beautiful perspective about ourselves. 
This week on Facebook, I put up a little poll. I said, has there ever been a time in your life where you felt beautiful, where you were 100% satisfied with how you looked? And while some people said, yes, absolutely, I am always satisfied with how I look, uh, there were many people who said, you know what? I've never felt beautiful or, hey, when I was an infant, I'm sure I was beautiful then. I probably felt pretty, but I've never really felt beautiful in my life. And this is not surprising to me. I grew up in a, a household with five sisters. I know what that looks like. I know the struggles that exist there. I've been in ministry now uh, for uh, over 20 years or just about 20 years. I've said, run into tons of different people and their low self-esteem and how they view themselves very poorly. And my hope is today that you will understand you are way more beautiful than you realize. That you are way more beautiful than you realize. And I hope to inspire inside of you that type of a perspective. Have you ever had an ugly moment? You know, an ugly moment when you're standing there in front of the mirror and you're looking at yourself and no matter how you turn yourself or what you suck in or how you dim the lights or change your clothes, you just feel ugly. When I say have you ever had an ugly moment, I'm not meaning what you look like, like your hair wouldn't work. Well, have you ever had an ugly moment where you just felt like there was nothing beautiful about yourself? Nothing at all. Well, if you were a friend of somebody that was having an ugly moment and they were pouring out their heart about how they never look pretty, they're not beautiful individuals, what would you tell them? Oh, don't be ridiculous. You might be having a bad hair day, but you're one good looking individual. You're beautiful. And plus there's more to you than how you look on the outside. Interestingly, that is exactly what God would say to you in your ugly moment. Could you jot down these couple of scriptures? Here's a few things you got to understand. Number one, Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 31. We realize in the early parts of the Bible, the very first chapter, that God went about creating things. And on day six, he made his most beautiful creation. He created man and woman. And he sat back on day seven, reached down into the Rocky Mountain streams, grabbed a cool one, cracked it open, and sat back and looked at things and said, man, this is all good. This is some good stuff that I just made right here. And that good stuff included people. When God created this planet and all that is in it, he only created one thing in his image. And that is human beings. We are image bearers of the beautiful God of the universe. Now, of course, that image bearing goes way deeper than the physical, and that's the point. When you stand in the mirror and you focus only on the physical and you feel ugly, you are forgetting how beautiful you are, and you are forgetting in that moment that you are created in the image of God. You need to remind yourself, I am not ugly. I am created in God's image, and he ain't ugly either. Created in God's image. So next time you have an ugly moment, remind yourself that you're not ugly. You got God's image all over you. Second, you need to remind yourself that you're not ugly because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, verse 14. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. David says, I praise you, O Lord, because you made me this way. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am an amazing creation, God, in your sight. You have knit me together in my mother's womb. You are involved in the process on some level. God, you are an amazing creator. Now, I didn't grow up going to church. Um, and my parents never gave me the birds and the bees talk. 
But I have learned over my last 40 years how babies are made. I get it. I understand. And while I understand all the biology that happens, when I read the scripture, specifically Psalm 139 here, I realize that there is much more going on than just the biological there. While God is using the biology, he is also somehow intimately involved in the creation of every individual. He was involved in creating you. So the way that you get dimples when you smile, the way your nose crinkles when you smile, those great little beauty marks along the edge of your eyes that you get as you go older, the way your hair parts, or the way it doesn't part, it just falls out. All of those things God had a hand in, in creating you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I want to encourage you to get to the spot where David did here. That you can get to the spot where you can praise God because how he created you. That you would not shortchange God of any praise when it comes to his creative work in your life. That you would praise him for all that he has done in putting you together, including the physical. Here are a few real practical tips that you might want to jot down. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, tells us that we should renew our minds, that we should not be conformed to this world and its ways, but that we should renew our minds and think differently about ourselves and about the world and about others. And so here are real, some real practical steps on how to renew your mind when it comes to beauty and having a God-honoring view, beauty, view of beauty. N number one, will you evaluate what you let into your life? In elementary school, we did this play, and there was this, this mantra that we would say during the play, garbage in, garbage out. Will you check and see what garbage you're letting into your life? Are you reading magazines, watching television shows, going on the internet, things that are totally focused on external beauty only? Are you elevating that in your heart and in your life above everything else? Now, it's okay to learn things about makeup. It's okay to want to look better physically, all those type of things. But have you brought into the lie that the culture is trying to tell you by letting it into your heart, into your life, into your schedule? Have you elevated those things or allowed them to be elevated by what you let in? Please, men and women, on a practical level, evaluate what you're putting in front of you. If you let garbage in, that garbage is going to come out in your attitude and actions towards other people. Second, remind yourself that you are a beautiful creation by writing Psalm 139 on your mirror. My wife has done this from time to time. She'll put little sticky notes on, the, on our mirror, on the um, girl's mirror, you know, and, and just try to remind all of us about how beautiful we really are and that beauty isn't uh, just our skin, but there's so much more valuable uh, about us, you know, that, that is in our, in our being. And this might be a good thing for you to do if you're really physically struggling with how you look. Write that psalm in makeup or write that psalm in marker. Put a little sticky note on your mirror and just remind yourself that you are beautiful and wonderfully made by God. And then finally, I want to encourage you to spend more time trying to beautify the inner part of your life as opposed to spending all of your money and your time trying to beautify the external part of your life. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4 tells us that physical training has value. It's good for us. But spiritual training, training of the inside, which God values above the outside, has value not only for this life, but also for the life to come. I want you to do your sit-ups, your push-ups, your pull-ups, your jogging, all of those type of things. 
But I want to encourage you to spend equal, if not more time, investing in the inside beauty that you have. Because men and women, that is what God values. That's what we should value in other people. And that's what we need to value in ourselves. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you love us and that you care about us. And God, I confess there have been way too many times in my life where I've judged people based on how they look, not on how you look at them. And God, I confess that as, as sin. And I don't want that to be the case for me or for any of us in this room. Oh God, would you help us to be secure in, in you, in ourselves, secure in your love for us? God, may you help us to focus on what you care about and what you want to focus on, God. And may you make us into the beautiful people that you are so worthy of. Thank you. Thank you. May we just have that God-honoring view of beauty as we leave here today. In Jesus' name, amen.